Nice presentation. Thank you, sir. OK, um, good presentation. Both of you uh, did really well. And even uh, the poster is good. So here I have uh, just one basic question. Since you have uh, written as a genome study, can you just tell me uh, what is the difference in this chromosome numbers in these snakes? Is there any difference in the chromosome number? Uh, no, ma'am. It's It won't have a difference in the chromosome number. It's just... The chromosome, the way what is being expressed will vary. The number of chromosomes will remain the same. OK, what they okay, basically. Fine, uh, oh, sorry. I just wanted to add yes. one more thing. What they basically yes, yes. code for or what they um, express would vary depending on the snake, ma'am. It won't vary with the number. So you mean to say, Malvika, all the snakes have the same chromosome number? No, no, no. I'm talking about the big four right now. Because that's the I for the venomous snakes. That's what I have basically put my like based my study on. OK, so I want uh, you to check it after your presentation, Malvika. Oh, all right. There are, there are Malvika, differences. Wrong, there is difference. I've not really gone through that much. I'm actually talking about the okay. gene, right? So I we have a lot to do yet. We just started this paper. So yeah. I'm not, sorry. Not, not an issue. Information. No, 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 not an issue. Okay, there's always, uh, no, it is good to see. Uh, just go and check it, like what exactly is the chromosome difference? Because when you have gone to molecular level, it's always uh, better to know what is the chromosomal differences. Definitely, okay. ma'am. We'll yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, all the best. All the best. Good presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Jai, we have any? OK, uh, so that's done with the first session. Hello? Yes, Sir? yes, Jai. Yeah, done. OK, OK. Your uh, concluding remarks, uh, both the chairpersons, if you have any, Dr. Manjula and uh, Lal Mohan Sangha, if you uh, sum it up thank you for chairing the session Your yeah, comments. thank you jay for the opportunity uh, in fact all of them presented really well uh, they have taken a lot of uh, time for uh, doing all these posters uh, very good uh, initiative jay and uh, the presentation all all the students really did well in fact uh, even the faculty and the students good presentation Thank you, Dr. Manjula. Uh, Mr. Lal Sangha, your comments. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Jayashankar for allowing us to chair this session. And I would also like to thank Dr. Manjula for sitting with me as a chairperson. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the organizing committee for this webinar so that uh, students can express their knowledge and which will en enrich each other's knowledge. Uh, uh, and this program is a very in interesting and rich, uh, rich program in which we can be all fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, your uh, presence reminds me of my stay in Arunachal Pradesh, a very short uh, duration in Itanagar. I know how beautiful the environment there is. And as I said yesterday, this is the Northeast is a gold mine to document biodiversity. So your lab is very, very vivid. Thank you for uh, the wonderful contributions your lab has given and best wishes for your future. Uh, with you, that, we, yeah, welcome, welcome uh, and thanks both of you. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the first session of the poster presentation. We are now getting into the second session of the poster presentation. This will be chaired by Dr. Sangeeta, head of the Department uh, of Zoology, Indian Academy Degree College and uh, Dr. Arun, uh, from the Department of Biotechnology, Christo Jayanti College. If both the chairpersons can acknowledge your presence. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jayashankar. I'm uh, Sangeeta here. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Arun? 
Yeah, good evening, Jay, and uh, good evening, all the participants, and all the best for your presentations. Thank you. I'll just call out the number names in uh, serial. We thought of shifting Mal Malavika to second session, but it has not happened. So there is a realignment. Students, kindly answer me if you are present here. The first presenter will be Suraj. That's from the Saida group. Suraj, you are there? Yes, sir. The second presenter will be Mayur. Mayur? Yes, sir. The third presenter will be Diti. Diti is here. She had sought permission because she is traveling. Okay, she's not responding. So chairpersons kindly note there will be an absence of the third candidate. The fourth candidate is Abhishek and team. Anybody from team Abhishek? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, you're there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next presenter is Akanksha. Yes, sir, I'm here. Done. Okay, over to the chairpersons. Uh, please restrict the time to exactly five minutes and one or two questions. Thank you. So, thank you, Shay. So, a gentle reminder for uh, the presenters. So, uh, since it is, I know call, uh, the presentation based on the review work, whatever you have conducted. So please try to highlight uh, the points. So highlight the important what you call uh, the breakthroughs in whatever the topic you are going to present it as such. Okay. So please uh, restrict uh, only for the presentation is restricted only for five minutes. Stick on to the time schedule as such, and all the very best. I now call upon the first present, Mr. Suraj, to share this slide. Yes, sir. Yeah. One second, two. If there's any technical glitch, please bring it to the notice of the chairperson. They can move on to the next also in case. They already shared. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the topic today we are going to uh, speak is about uh, Kings of India. Me, my teammates, uh, Saida, Saba, and Malavika have prepared a, uh, a info poster based on the topic Kings of India. So uh, recently, the Zoological Survey of India has uh, bought a study on Kings, titled Kings of India. So uh, Kings of India is considered the largest family of lizards uh, with 1,602 species of Kings across the world. Uh, having long bodies, relatively small or no legs, no pronounced neck and glossy scales. It is found around homes and local places such as playgrounds and around lakes. Skinks are non-venomous, high alert, agile and fast moving and actively forage for a vari variety of insects and small invertebrates. Uh, they have a prominent role in maintaining ecosystems. However, not much is known about their breeding habitats and ecology because identification of the species can be confusing. In India, skinks are found in all kinds of habitat in the country, from the Himalayas to the coast and from the dense forest to the deserts. Uh, it gives a pol pol uh, phylogenetic and uh, biogeographical analysis of distribution of these species in all the 11 biogeographic uh, zones of India. Uh, India is home to less than 4% of the skinks across the globe. 62 species of skinks are found in India and about 57% of them uh, are endemic. India is home to 16 genera of skinks, uh, 4 of which are endemic. The 4 genera of skinks are uh, uh, Sepsophis, Sepsophis uh, punch, uh, punch status is endemic to the northern part of uh, Eastern Ghats. Uh, Barcudia, the, these are uh, limbless uh, skinks found in the hills and the uh, coastal plains of eastern coast. 
Barcudia insularis is believed to be found on the Barcudia island, island of Chilka Lake in Odisha. Uh, Barcudia melanostica is endemic to Vishakhapatnam, Andhra Pradesh, India. Uh, Rishtella, they are also known as cats kings and endemic to the southern part of Western Ghats. So these are the few basic information on based on skins of India. Yeah. Share questions. Suraj, uh, that was a very wonderful talk. Uh, is it possible for you to differentiate? How do you differentiate skinks? from other lizards? Sir, so basically uh, these are non-venomous. Uh, so we can dif uh, differentiate to that. Uh, so many of them are might be uh, like venomous or... So uh, it's a really good uh, poster. Thank you, Suraj. Uh, Thank you. We will switch on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Amit, uh, you will yeah. be chairing the third session, the next session. OK. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, Arun, Dr. Arun and Dr. Sangeeta, any comments? And then you can proceed to the next. No, we can move to the next okay. uh, poster. Yeah, that's Mayur. Mayur, you can share. Suraj, you can unshare. Thank you, sir. Hello. Is my screen visible? Yes, Mayur. Good evening, I'm Mayur from Bangalore. I'm doing my botany and zoology, BSc in botany and zoology in St. Joseph. And so my topic is the Boya Russelli, that is Russell's Viper. Russell Viper is also known as the Boya Chain Viper. It is a venomous snake that belongs to the Viper family. There are two subspecies of Russell's Viper that can be in, found in India. One is the Boya Russelli and the Boya Siaminesis. So, Southeast Asia, China, and Taiwan. Russell's Viper inhabits plain, forest, scrubland, grasslands, and agriculture fields. Major threats for the survival of the Russell's Viper are traffic accidents and organized killing in some part of Asia. Russell's Viper is on high target of hunters because of its skin and meat. Despite these factors, Russell, Russell's Viper are widely distributed and numer numerous in wild. Here are some interesting facts about Russell Viper. Russell Viper can reach up to 3.3 to 5.5 feet in length. Russell's Viper has deep yellow beige or brown body covered with dark brown almond shaped spots surrounded with black ring. The belly is white or yellow, sometimes pinkish in color and usually covered with irregular dark marking. It has a flattened triangular head, blunt stout and long two long fangs, large nostrils, and medium-sized eye with a vertical pupils. It has stout cylindrical body and short tail. Body of Russell Viper is covered with keel scales. Russell Viper is named after famous Scottish herpetologist Patrick Russell, who described this and many other Indian snakes. Russell Viper is a terrestrial snake that is adapted to life on solid ground. It moves slowly and sluggishly until it is threatened. Russell's Viper is a nocturnal animal that is active during the night, except, except during the cool periods of the year when it becomes active during the day. Russell Viper is a carnivore. Its diet is based on rodents and small mammals, birds, lizards, and frogs are occasionally on the menu. Russell Viper likes to bask in the sun during the day. When it's not basking, it hides in the, into the caves, cracks in the soil, or under reef, leaf refuge. Russell vipers can be often found in urban and rural areas because they provide plenty of food because of rodents. 
Consequently, Russell Viper often gets in touch with pe people and induces more snake bite than other types of venomous snakes. It has a very strong venom, which in induces strong bleeding. It has hemotoxic venom and paralyzes of neck muscles, permanent renal damage and death in case of antivenin is not available. Thank you. So it was a good uh, presentation, Mayor. So uh, one uh, suggestion, actually it is a poster presentation, right? Hello, Mayor. Yes, yeah, it's a poster presentation. So yes. here it, uh, what we expect is, okay, it is just how you are going to design a poster based on the facts, okay, whatever you have. Okay, if it is a review, you have to just arrange in such a way that a brief abstract or a brief what you call graphical abstract should be there. It should be diagrammatic representation and you're going to explain your understanding of that particular subject as such. It is just a brief intro into the snakes, okay, especially the Russell Viper as such. Okay, uh, what, I, uh, what we expected is... Uh, the poster like what we call presentation as such but anyways your understanding into the uh, uh, russell viper and its what we call uh, the basic uh, knowledge is uh, good and you have presented it neatly and we expect from the article presenters a neat poster as such okay that is one thing the other important thing is can you just what we call link uh, the uh, what is that food web okay taking russell viper into consideration as such food web can you explain the food web how it is going to be called helping the food web as such yeah what is the importance of this uh, maintaining the ecological balance okay by the snakes as such any idea that goes into it it helps in uh, controlling rodents pests so. okay okay Okay, what, what if, if there is no, uh, what you call snakes or uh, uh, the other, what you call types of the snakes in the habitat as such, okay, what will happen? We would have more pests and it'll, it'll be a, it'll be damage to the farms for the farmers to be a chaos, yeah. Okay, 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 sir, yeah. Ma'am, if you have any uh, questions. Thank yeah, I don't have any uh, questions more. I go with uh, what uh, Dr. Arun has uh, told just now. If it was a pictorial presentation, it would have been better. But you have given a very good information about uh, Russell's Viper. Yeah, so we can yeah. move ahead to the next one. Yeah, okay. yes. Uh, thank you, Mayur. The next speaker is Abhishek. Yeah. Uh, OK, sir. Uh, Am I audible, sir? Yeah, one minute. I think there is some confusion. I, my apologies to uh, Dr. Sangeeta and Dr. Varun and Dr. Uh, Kutta Somaya also, because there is a mix up of the session two and session three. That's why Dr. Amit uh, joined, I believe. I'm sorry for this confusion. Uh, we'll go ahead. Actually, there's a third session presenters who are in the second session. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, it's come to my notice. Thank you. Okay, okay, it's okay, uh, Dr. J. Okay, can we have a next presenter? That is Abhishek, right? Okay, Abhishek, you can share your screen. Uh, okay, sir, am I audible? Uh, you are perfectly audible, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, is my poster visible, sir? Yeah, it's visible. Can you just enlarge that? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Abhishek Mishra, second year BCCBZ student at St. Joseph College, Bangalore. I'm here presenting the topic, Mimicry in Snakes. 
while discussing the topic mimicry in snakes we should discuss the two question what is mimicry in nature why mimicry is done by the snakes so first what is mimicry in nature mimicry is a biological phenomenon characterized by the superficial re resemblance of two or more organism not closely related taxonomically the second one now let's see why mimicry is done by the sub snakes mimicry in snakes are seen mainly by the non venomous snakes is known as Batesian mimicry, where non-venomous snakes do the mimicry of the venomous one. They look similar in color and pattern to the venomous one to be safe from the predators. So here are some examples of post type one to which we can understand how snakes do the mimicry of the other snakes. So first example is of Lycodon and Bungaris. Lycodon commonly known as bull snake and Bungaris known as common carrot. They are very similar in color and pattern. They both have white and black bands. The only difference which we can see easily is the wolf's, wolf snake has a square like snout, but it is not present in the carrot and the snake and the neck of the carrot is hardly seen. Second example is of Calophis bibroni infant and the Cyanomarcurus. The infant of the Calophis looks very similar to the deadly venomous snake Cyanomarcurus. The only difference is the white band present on the head of the Cyanomarcurus. The third example is of red snake and the Indian spectacle cobra. They both look similar in the body pattern and the color. The difference is only the hood present in the cobra. The last example is of oligodon oculinitus and calophis intestinalis. This oligodon looks similar in color and pattern to the deadly snake calophis intestinalis, which help these snakes to keep away the predators. At last, some more snakes are given. They have well defending cap capabilities, but then also they have well developed characters which help them to keep up with the predators or help them to hide in the surrounding environment that is known as camouflage. Like Spectacle Cobra and the King Cobra have hood which help them to look bigger, more dangerous. And the Python and the Viper snakes have a dry leaf like color and pattern on their body which help them to hide. At last, I want to add a very important point here why mimicry in snake is a topic to be known by everyone. So, because there are around 270 species of snakes in India, among which only 60 species are the venomous one. This means rest are totally benign. Many times in the village, we hear the news about a person died due to a snake bite, but all the time the snake is not the venomous one. People are bitten by the non-venomous and they die due to the heart attack. And also many times we hear in the village, there are some people, exocrists, who bring out the poison from the body of the snake's biting person. The main question here is how villagers start believing on them. The only reason is person is bitten by a red snake or a wolf snake or any other snake, which is the non-venomous one, when taken to this exorcist and that exorcist act like they are doing some worship, reciting some mantra and the person survive. The person survived not due to that exorcist, but the reason is there is no poison only in the body of that person and the villagers start believing on that exorcist and many lives are taken away later by that exorcist. So everyone should know about the venomous and non-venomous snakes about the mimicry in the snakes. At last occurred, don't judge a snake by its color. Thank you everyone. Uh, it's a really a very good presentation Abhishek and the poster also is designed uh, very creatively. Yeah, it's a creative poster. And my question here is, okay, can you just throw some light on uh, what is Batesian mimicry? Uh, yes, sir. Batesian mimicry, when any non-venomous uh, creature uh, act like, like mimic like the another venomous one to be safe from the predator, like uh, having the red color, like once the predator learn about that red color is dangerous one, so when this uh, non-venomous creatures take this red color and mimic like the another one, so they can be safe from the predators. This is okay. the Batesian mimicry. Another type of mimicry uh, where the two well defending, having the well defending capabilities, creatures do them each other's mimic, like uh, sharing the uh, auditory signals. Yeah, uh, exactly, Abhishek. I wanted to ask you that question only. <laughs> Whether there are any other, uh, other than visual mimicry, is there any other? I wanted to ask you. You have answered that also. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe I don't think this is in the scope of your presentation because you say that there is an what you call a similarity between uh, different uh, uh, organisms as such or the different species of uh, 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 snakes as such. 
So can you just sort of link to the genes, specific genes that is going to be expressed in those uh, species as such? Say for example, the patterning. If you can just see the uh, patterning in patterning in some of the species, you said it remains the same. Okay, is there the same gene that is expressed in both the species as such? Any idea as such? So we know that all this phenotype is uh, governed by the genes expression of a specific type of genes, right? So since they have a same patterning, same coloring and all, do you think that uh, this particular genes are expressed in both the species as such? Any idea? Any? I'm not insight? sure for that, sir. Yeah. But I think they yeah. share, I don't, yeah, I think sir, they yeah. share the yeah. genes, yes, sir. Yeah, because what we see is, okay, most of the resemblance is seen in uh, very closely related species as such, okay? You have uh, explained one uh, set of uh, what you call snakes as such, it belongs to two different genus as such, but they resemble the same what you call uh, patterning as such, okay? For that reason, I had a doubt, okay, whether uh, the genes which are expressing are the same, in both the species, whether it is a closely related or whether it is an, a distant related species as such, okay? So maybe mm -hmm. uh, if you can just uh, get into the details of it, okay, that will be better, I guess, okay? Most of the times, okay, if it is genetic variation or the variation that is seen in uh, the species, it is all governed by uh, the genes as such. There are certain set of genes, okay, which will uh, be responsible for this color polymorphisms or similarity in the patterns as such. Okay, and yes, sir. It was really a very nice presentation. Thank you. Can we have Thank next you, presenter? Who is that? It's Akansha. 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 Yeah. yeah. Akansha, if you're sharing. Uh, meanwhile, I'll announce uh, the list for the third session. Dr. Puttaswamaya and uh, Dr. Amit Hegde will be chairing it. Prabhav, Michelle, Kritika, Shivani, and Ajalia. Is Akansha there to start with this presentation? Okay, can we have Driti? Driti. Driti is around. Uh, no, I Can think. Name uh, my, uh, uh, hmm. I, I think, think I'll become. Network issues. Yes, that's what but, she has expressed. Okay, Driti, no problem. Uh, you're traveling. That's what you're texting uh, me. Okay. Uh, so then we are done with the second session. Akansha has not. Uh, uh, so, yeah. so, so can the next speaker go? I'll go after the next speaker. There seem to be some technical issues. Technical issue. Okay. Uh, is Prabhav here? Prabhav? Or Michelle? Sir, I can do. Yeah, proceed. I tell your title and proceed. So Michelle will be the last presenter in uh, second session. Instead of Michelle in third session, Akansha will shift to third session. Uh, the chairpersons, Dr. BVP and Amit Hegde can note. Uh, we request students to be short and crisp and uh, make it fast and also the chairpersons restricting to one or two questions. So is my screen visible? Let's go ahead, please. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am Michelle from third MC set. Uh, I would be talking on the topic of uh, with salamanders in India. So in India, we can only find one species of salamander that is um, Tylototriton 
varicosis. So it belongs to the class Amphibia, order Chordata, and family Salamandriae. Uh, it is generally called, uh, it has a common name, Mandarin Salamander or the Himalayan Mute. The species is distributed in the hills and mountains of Himalayan system in the northeastern India, Sikkim and Darjeeling districts. The animal can be found where, uh, where we have the mountain forest or where the mountain forest previously existed and which has now been converted to the rice fields, meadows covering the shores of mountains, ponds and lakes. So to, uh, giving a big, brief discussion uh, description about the salamander. So it is a unique, rare, tailed amphibian. So it is a newt with that can reach to a length of about 20 centimeter. It has a tongue. It has a small tongue and is free on sides and only slightly towards its base. The teeth on the palate are in two oblique rows that meet at front of the mouth. They have five toes and tail is flattened to aid swimming. Head is wide and snout is short and head has three prominent bony ridges with pores. There are no lobes on the lips. So talking about its diet or its nutrition, since they are amphibians, they, are, they can survive both on uh, land as well as on water. So they capture prey from both aquatic and terrestrial habitat. They feed on spiders, worms, millipid, scorpions, mollusks, and range and range of insects. Reproduction. So reproduction, um, it has a particular uh, method of reproduction. So it has a breeding season that is a uh, end of March to beginning of April, and it has a breeding site that is a rock pools. Uh, and we can see sexual dimorphism in both males and females. So females are generally uh, larger and it is heavier than the males. Uh, the courtship occurs during night or after heavy rains and the mating has um, a complex behavior. According to me, I find it's a little complex because the, uh, the male tries to in impress the female and then after the female agrees, um, it goes ahead. So I find it a little complex. Uh, what are the threats that we find to the salam so talking about the threat, there is no recorded increase or decrease um, uh, in the number of the salamanders. But uh, as we all know, since there is pollution of, uh, there is destruction and pollution of ponds because of which the salamanders uh, number is gradually reducing. And um, uh, finally, talking about the methods that we can help uh, that we can do to preserve them. So first thing is we can avoid its handling. So if uh, if uh, even though if we find it somewhere, uh, we have to prevent prevent from touching because salamanders have very absorbent skin. Thus the salts and oils from the human hands can harm the salamanders. So it's better just to observe them if we find them. Second is keep them wild. Since they stay in wild atmosphere, we should not keep them as pets. And finally, if we find them crossing somewhere, um, let us allow to cross it peacefully. Thank you. Uh, chairpersons can take over. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, you have uh, given a good uh, presentation. Uh, I have one question. Uh, do you see, uh, are they considered as any indicator species? Salamanders, are they indicator species? Ma'am, as I know, um, they feed on mosquitoes and yeah, they are considered as um, indicators because they maintain the normal um, ecological balance. Okay, I think uh, with that we have come to the end of the second session. Uh, uh, any concluding remarks from Dr. Arun and Dr. Sangeeta? Uh, am I audible? Yes, madam. Yeah. Yes, madam. Uh, I would like to congratulate all the uh, presenters. Uh, you have done it pretty well and uh, congratulate all of them for their hard work and uh, my appreciation to the faculty members also Dr. Jayashankar and the organizing committee for this initiative and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this seminar. So thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah. So first of all I'd like 
to thank uh, the faculty members of St. Joseph's College uh, for uh, igniting the spark, uh, research spark in the students that to the undergraduate students. I can see that uh, most of the students have done uh, excelled well. Okay, they presented well, okay, on par with uh, the uh, research scholars as such, okay. And uh, if they, if we can just mold the students and just uh, 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 mentor the students in this particular area, definitely we can see that a lot of particular scientists, okay, many scientists in this particular uh, uh, session, I could see that the prospective scientists as such, okay, in the field of herpetology. Okay, congratulations once again for all the participants as well as the organizers. And uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Jay for giving me an opportunity to just uh, uh, preside over the session and I also got a lot of protocol information uh, related to the herpetology and the biodiversity and other aspects of such. Okay, really insightful presentations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both uh, the chairpersons. We are now slipping into the third session. Uh, may I have Dr. B.V. Puttaswamaya from uh, Tumkur and uh, Dr. Amit Egde from Darwad University. Can I have your consent to both the chairpersons? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for accepting our invitation to chair the third session. Let me call out the student's name. Uh, guys, keep it uh, crisp. Uh, uh, Hina can go ahead. Hina is here. Can you answer? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Hina Am is audible? one. Yeah, you're audible. Two Thank is uh, Akanksha. You sent your uh, PPT to Rakshit. Yes, sir, I have. Okay, so two second will be Akansha, uh, three will be Kritika, four will be Shivani, yes, five sir. will be Natalia. Okay. Yes, yes. Sir. We'll start with Hina. Uh, chair, over to chairpersons, Dr. BVP and uh, Amit. Yeah, Hina, you can you can proceed. All the very best. Thank you so much, sir. Just a second, sir. Uh, sir, is my screen is visible? Hello? Yes, you can. Yes, you can proceed. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, my name is Khan Hina. And I completed my uh, post-graduation in uh, zoology from uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Maratwada University from zoology department. And uh, today I'm presenting uh, the poster, uh, which is based on the topic uh, that parental care in uh, reptiles. The parental care uh, may refer to the behavior that contribute to offspring survival. Forms of care may include the presenting uh, the preparing for a physical rearing environment, the provisioning of spring or the defending of spring from a predators. The parental care may be beneficial at offspring, survival, quality of a reproductive success is improved as these ultimately increase the parental inclusive fitness. When parental care occur in reptiles, it is usually female only or biparental care. Then uh, usually the parental care which is occur in reptile, uh, there are different types of parental care which um, occur in a reptiles. But today I'm going to represent the three main types of parental care which is occur or uh, seen in a reptile. The first one is curling around the eggs. Second type or second one is clumping of eggs. And third one is special type of parental care which is shown by the crocodiles. So first type of a parental care in reptile is curling around the eggs. Although a few species of lizards and snakes remain with their clutch, often curling around eggs for entire incubation period, toward the end of the incubation period, they are capable to raise their body temperature above the ambient level through muscular contractions and curling around their eggs. These generate the muscular thermogenesis. The muscular thermogenesis is a special biological process 
through which the organism will utilize the calories of the body to generate the heat that's why this is called as a thermogenesis in this type of a special mechanism the different types of muscles of reptile body is involved like brown adipose tissues and also the muscular tissues are involved in production of a thermogenesis so as we can see in a picture that the lizard is curled around his or her eggs okay so the second type of parental care uh, which is i represent today in my poster that is clamping of eggs okay when a little wet eggs get that they get dried they stuck together and they form the clump of or a mass of a eggs it is uh, to keep them away from rolling to keep them in a brood clumping of eggs seen in a geckos and snakes that protected the eggs from predators and maintain the optimal temperature which is a uh, required or necessity of that eggs so as we can see in a picture that the clumping of eggs we seen in a picture the these are the eggs of a snake and they are clumped together okay the third one which is i am representing today that is a special type of parental care which is occur in a crocodile when a female crocodile or alligator lay her eggs in a shallow pit on a river bank covers them with a the soil and guards them while they develop when they are ready to hatch the young makes squeaking noise the mother digs open the nest and makes the youngest to water crocodile eggs hatch in about the 3 months the mother carefully carries those young ones okay uh, to special nursery to keep them in a protected areas so in a picture we can see that the mother crocodile carry her young one in a mouth with very careful uh, or carefully and carry that young one to the safe place so uh, this is all about the parental care in a reptiles and uh, thank you so much for uh, for providing me the opportunity to participate and um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity thank you so much all of you no it's a nice presentation Yes. Kina? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, and you are a PG student, right? Yes, I am actually PG student, and I am actually preparing for PhD. Oh, fine. Uh, you have done a good work. And uh, is there any hormonal influence on the uh, thermogenesis? What you said, muscular thermogenesis, right? Right. So sorry, I don't have any information regarding that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, you did a good job. Thank you, uh, okay. sir. Any other question? Uh, yeah, it was a wonderful presentation, Hina, and also uh, keep an eye on uh, uh, the number of eggs uh, they lay where there is a parental care. usually uh, there will be low number of eggs they lay and uh, majority of them hatch and they will make up to adult uh, this thing uh, it's maybe you have read that in r selection and k selection all the best we will move on to next presentation thank you so much for your suggestions i will keep that in my mind next time thank you so much thank you so much The next presenter uh, for the information of the chairpersons, Akansha, who could not share it in the second session, will be doing it now. Rakshit will be helping her in sharing. Both of the chairpersons. बहुत अच्छा presentation रहा बोल रहे हो ना? किसका? मेरा और किसका? कुछ भी. Hina, your mic is still on. Your excitement is revealed. We are happy that you are excited. Oh, Dr. Kangsha. Hello. Yes. 
so uh, sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, I am Akanksha. I'm uh, currently pursuing my bachelor's in St. Joseph's College. And today I'll be doing a poster presentation on nesting in king cobras. So the king cobra is a venomous elapid. Elapid is a family of uh, snakes. It's endemic to South and Southeast Asia. So in uh, India, the snake is found in various regions. It's found in the Western Ghats. It's found in North and Northeastern India, uh, typically Uttar Pradesh, the Terai region, Bihar, West Bengal, and it's also found in the Andaman Islands. It is the largest venomous snake in the world, and it is the only snake in the world which builds a nest. Nesting is commonly seen, seen in birds, but this is the only snake which exhibits this behavior. So uh, King Cobra mating season, it starts in early February in India. Uh, also, the months and the timings of mating and breeding are highly variable depending on the region. Uh, it can even be different in the Western Ghats and, uh, let's say, in Northeast. Uh, so this is just a generalization. So it starts in early February. So males, they seek out females by detecting pheromones, which have been secreted by the females. So uh, more, uh, more often than not, more than one male will vie for a particular female. So they fight. Uh, so these males fight for that female via male combat and whoever but they are careful to not you know injure each other very badly because these snakes are cannibalistic as well so the winner then mates with the female and then after female the gravid female uh, so, sorry after mating the gravid female she leaves to um, search for a place to build her nest so the female is gravid for around two months but again this can depend on the region uh, so the king cobra nesting season in India lasts from April to July. So the nesting behavior also depends on the habitat. For example, in Mizoram, where you have bamboo forests, they can use bamboo sticks to make their nests. In Western Ghats, where there is a lot of leaf litter, they use uh, they use leaf litter and other organic material or other plant material to build their nest. Uh, so they build a two-story chambered nest. So in the first uh, story, they deposit the eggs. And in the second chamber, is, that's where the female resides. And uh, she can reside there for maybe uh, 10 to 14 days, after which she leaves the nest. And then the hatchlings uh, have to fend for their own. And uh, this is uh, the abandonment of uh, nests happens because king cobras do have a cannibalistic instinct. And throughout this entire uh, breeding and nesting period, she does not eat anything. So uh, she needs to move away from the nest, otherwise she might end up eating the eggs. Uh, so in Agumbe rainforest, the clutch size of the nest, uh, the uh, eggs can be around 23 to uh, 43 uh, eggs. And during this, uh, king cobras are generally very shy, but during this particular period, they become really ferocious and they guard the nests ferociously against predators and it's mainly the female who guards the nests in India there are uh, the males typically do not guard the nests but outside India there have been some uh, reports of the male guarding the nest as well so that's all thank you yeah Kangsha uh, as a UG student you have uh, done a good job a nice thank presentation you. thank you sir uh, and I have a uh, Simple question. The image is what you have posted. Are your uh, own or uh, you have collected from the net? So I've collected it from the internet and I've even uh, cited the source of the images. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, try to have a look uh, and enjoy its phenotype ones. Hmm? It's a majestic animal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, if you have any questions, you can say. Thank you, Dr. Bibi, sir. Uh, Akanksha, it's a really good presentation, uh, especially I enjoyed the geographical variation in the nesting part. Now there are multiple species. Uh, please yes, keep yes. an eye and I'm all okay. the very best. Yes, thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Okay, Bibi, sir, we yeah. will move on to next presentation. Yeah, the third presenter, yes, Kritika.
Hello. Sir, so, is the poster visible? Yes, Krutika, you can. You can proceed. Good evening, all. Uh, today, we both, Krutika and Joe, we are here to present on topic crocodile conflict, crocodile, human crocodile conflict. As human population continue to increase, people are increasingly encroaching on natural areas. As a result, the relation between people and wildlife is, is often antagonistic because of competition and de decline, declining of resources. Such conflict commonly arise when, con uh, when wildlife cause damage to crops or kill livestock and when they occasionally involve attacks on people. Human wildlife conflict is a growing problem worldwide and crocodilians are one of the major group involved. Attacks by crocodile, crocodiles and alligators are increasing in many parts of the world, including developed nations. Example, saltwater crocodiles, crocodilus porosus in Australia. Crocodiles are the top predators and keystone species and perform an important role in maintaining the biodiversity structure and function of freshwater ecosystem. There are three species of crocodiles in India that are crocodilus porosus, gavialis gangitis, and crocodilus polystris. The human crocodile conflict was witnessed within 672, uh, 672 km square in uh, Bitar uh, Khanika Wildlife Sanctuary, Odisha, of saltwater crocodiles, uh, crocodiles, crocodilus porosus. Forestry department contained records of 51 attacks on people, 57 on cattle over 21 years, from 1996 to 2016. The attacks were found to be highest in monsoon season and summer and lowest in the uh, lowest in post monsoon and winter seasons. The activities involved get, uh, people getting attacked with do, uh, domestic uh, chorus, crossing rivers, bathing, fishing, and grazing and cultivation. These people who were affected negatively from the conflict tended to tended to be negative towards the conversation of uh, salt water crocodiles. Therefore, there are researches uh, with aim to serve the planning of migration strategies for future. Over to Kritika. Kritika, you are not audible. Please uh, take on fast. Yes, sir. In the second case, National Chambal Sanctuary is at the borders of three districts in the state of Madhya, Madhya Pradesh and North India. In this part of National Chambal Sanctuary, two species of crocodiles, that is Gavialis gangetix and Crocodilus falsaris, are present. In the 50 km of river stretch, there are eight important basking areas of crocodiles and six important nesting areas and two kilometer of sandbars for nesting. People use the river for various purposes. As a result, 29% of people reported that they are negatively affected by the presence of crocodile and 37 casualties of animals like goats, cows, buffaloes, dogs have occurred. This was due to crocodile rehabilitation program initiated by initiated in late 1970s under Indian Crocodile Project. As a result, the population of crocodiles have increased. The increased Magga population uh, pose a potential threat to human and their livestock living in livestock living in the village along the banks of the Chambal River. And the last example is the Sub Sundaban forest. The Sundaban is the largest tidal mangrove forest. All the three species of crocodiles are found here, and the estuarian crocodiles currently inhabit about 2,500 kilometers of, in, of Indian Sundarban. As a result, human crocodile conflicts increased during um, 1990 due to large scale of human encroachment into the crocodile's territory. They recorded uh, 127 incidents of human crocodile conflict during 20, 2000. To 2013, most of victims were crab collectors, fishes, tiger prawn seed collectors. As a result, uh, uh, it's the, there is there is a need for primary pre prevention, which involves minimizing contact between the people and crocodiles, like generating awareness and um, banning or restricting the entry of people in eye crocodile regions. 
hence it is important to answer both crocodiles and humans thank you sir thank you kritika zoe it was a wonderful presentation and uh, i hope you might be knowing uh, relocating the saltwater crocodiles and uh, freshwater crocodiles are completely different from uh, snakes yes it's one of the severe issues uh, all the very best uh, dr bv sir you have something to add yeah uh, kritika and uh, and the person uh, you did a good presentation and you have selected a nice topic and there is a small suggestion for you kritika thank you sir yeah uh, try to select a, a topic where you can uh, involve in the field work uh, that will be much better huh? yes, than sir. collecting the information uh, from the other sources okay yeah try to do it. Uh, i think you are a, a ug student right yes sir third year oh, oh, oh fine mm -hmm. yeah. thank you nice presentation good work thank you thank you sir yeah jay shankar uh, we can move on to the next one okay the next presenter is shivani shivani is here or her group members yes sir okay yes sir good evening uh, everyone yeah humble request students uh, kindly keep it crisp okay okay so so good evening everyone i piyush and my friend Mansi and Shivani from Saint Joseph College are here to present our post on the topic Garial conservation in India. One of the most important point to start with is that Garial are the last remaining species of an ancient family named Gavilidae. So now let's now let's see what are Garials. Gavilus gangeticus, also known as Garial, is a fish-eating crocodile and is among one of the longest of all existing crocodile species. The name gharial comes from the Hindi word ghada, which means mud pot. The ghada is referred to a bulbous knob that starts to grow on the snout of male gharial when they grow 10 years old. Male gharials produce a loud noise, unique to them as a social signal with the help of its ghada. The gharials are currently inhabiting the rivers and plains in northern part of the Indian subcontinent. And now my friend Mansi will continue. Mansi, continue. Thank you. Thank you, Piyush. So here, as you all can see, some of the news headlines showing deaths of gharial in large numbers. These news headlines indicate a large decline in the gharial population in India. The major reasons for the gharial disappearance are habitat entanglement in fishing nets, hunting, sand mining, construction of dams and barrages, and many more. And now, my friend Sivani will highlight some important points on conservation of this critically endangered species. So what are the steps taken to conserve the gharial population in India? The wild gharial population was in a steep decline since the 1930s. The population had drastically reduced to a mere 200 in the mid-1970s. This brought in the much-publicized Project Crocodile. Once boasted as the most successful conservation story in India, however, the conservation program is in shambles today. This can be attributed by the lack of involvement of the locals. Currently, we have the Gharial Conservation Alliance, which is an international organization of individuals from various backgrounds and its allies, assessing past failures and developing new strategies to stem the decline of the Gharial population. Through different conservation programs, the population of the gharials in India has now risen from 200. At present, the largest wild population resides in the National Chambal Sanctuary, Madhya Pradesh, India. The river is home to almost 1,600 individuals, that is about 80% of the global gharial population. My friend Mansi will take over from here on. So why are gharials so important? why they need to be conserved. The main reason being the gharials are the apex of apex predators in forest 
and their presence is crucial to maintain the health of freshwater rivers. Lastly, we will see some important points on how we can save gharias. The first point is by protecting their habitat, we can create a healthy environment for them. Secondly, by monitoring their population and recording all the tracks. The third point is by restocking their population. The most important point is to involve fishing communities in conservation. And lastly, we should promote conservation awareness among the locals so that we can save Ghadiyal from going extinct. Because this earth was made for all beings, not just for human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Smriti. Yeah, Shivani, Mansi, and Kumar. Uh, nice presentation and a nice poster. And you have collected ample information. Uh, good. Uh, sir, if any questions, you can. It's a very wonderful presentation. They are the most iconic species of uh, Chambal River and surrounding area and unique uh, face of, you know, uh, that river too. Uh, have you given any attention on the river pollution that affects uh, Garia? Actually, sir, I did read up a little bit on it, very little information actually. So the corpses that float, the human corpses, the gharials, it has been recorded that even though gharials uh, uh, don't attack humans, uh, they actually feed on these corpses that float in the river. Thank you. Uh, very well presented. Uh, all the very best. We will move Thanks. on to next presentation. Uh, the you, last sir. presenter for this session is uh, Natalia. Natalia, over to you. This is the last presentation for session three. Okay, uh, uh, hello, uh, everyone. Guys, uh, you have to unshare. Piyush, uh, only when you unshare, uh, she can, Natalia can share. Okay, Natalia, go ahead. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, a very warm welcome to everyone present here. Can you see my screen? Uh, is my screen yes. visible? Yes, I will share the. Okay. So, today I chose the topic of conservation of turtles in the state of Assam. So, uh, so the first one that I took over here is basically the black soft shell turtle or the Nilsana nigricans over here. So basically this particular species were actually considered to be extinct in the wild by the IUCN red list in 2002. Only to be rediscovered again in the 2004 in the pond of the Bastina Shrine in Bangladesh. So these particular species are actually endemic to the uh, basin of the river Brahmaputra. Uh, and for the main reason why this particular species actually went extinct at the very first site was due to being sold uh, illegally in the black markets for its meat as well as trafficked uh, and sold at high prices to be kept as pets. Okay, so the second one over here that I took was the Assam roofed turtle. Oh, and this is a comparatively very small turtle species than the black soft shell turtle. Uh, the very first reason for being uh, endangered uh, is uh, that these turtles are actually trafficked at very high price uh, to be sold as pets, though they are not really sold as meat. And another of the reason is uh, sometimes being caught in the fishing nets by fishermen. Uh, both of these turtles are actually conserved in Assam, mainly in the ponds of the temples. And the third one that I took over here is again the Indian peacock soft shell turtle, which is also which, uh, is also really endemic to the northeastern region of the country. And 
This particular species is also actually considered to be critically endangered by the IUCN Red List. This species too actually faced uh, uh, this species too was actually considered uh, became endangered due to hunting and uh, selling in the black market for its meat. And also this species too is actually uh, conserved in the temple grounds, which is in the ponds of the state. So as you can see that in conclusion, all the species mainly in Assam are actually considered in the temple grounds. Although we don't have a particular uh, platform for conserving these species other than a temple ground, which is also a good thing because there have been cases and instances where an uh, conservation center originally starts as a conservation center by funding from government and by people, but slowly it actually changes into a farm for in which the turtles are actually produced for the purpose of being sold uh, to the sold for meat. So thank you. With that, I end the presentation. So that was a very interesting and uh, really good presentation. Uh, so is there any uh, census or any other works has been done in Assam? Because uh, I think uh, from Turtle Surveillance of India, uh, there, are, there have been some good works in the north part of India. Uh, yes, sir, but in Assam, generally uh, there are no solid like uh, uh, platforms for conservation of these turtles basically they are conserved in temple ponds only in the and one of the biggest temple where these are actually conserved is the Hajo, Hajo temple uh, sorry it's the high grade Madhavdev temple which is situated in Hazo Okay, Natalia, that was really good. I think we have a, a future field biologist. Uh, maybe you can pursue that dream. Uh, that actually, yeah, I actually thought of that, but it needs a lot of like effort for starting such a major project and also a lot of like help from many other people. All the very best. Thank you, sir. Dr. Yeah, Natalia, it was a nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you have collected a, a good information. And involve some more, much, uh, much more into the same field. And you need to learn um, some more contents regarding this. I hope you will continue the same, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, all the very best. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, with that, we have come to the conclusion of the third session. I uh, request both the chairperson to give to give their concluding remarks. Sir, you can. Maybe, sir. OK, so I'll start. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jay Shankar, sir, for giving the opportunity. All of the students were enthusiastic, and uh, some of the enthusiasm, even we uh, we were able to hear of that their presentation. And uh, it's popularly said that of all the souls that walk on the Mother Earth, there is a just handful that would stand for her. I can see more future biologists, conservationists, and uh, field biologist standing for Mother Earth. All the very best. Thank you once again. Well said, sir. Uh, St. Joseph's University is giving a uh, very good platform for the budding scientists uh, with the best faculty team like uh, Mr. Jay Shankar. 
thank you jay shankar for the uh, opportunity to chair the session and all the very best uh, for all the uh, presenters good work thank you thank you both of you thank you dr amit for accepting uh, in the last minute uh, deepak was supposed to chair he had an emergency you kindly consented i am grateful to you for accepting our invitation to chair the session uh, coming to dr bvp bvp and me our classmates uh, very good friends uh, again i reached out and uh, a friend uh, in need is actually friend in need sometimes my friend uh, readily accepted to chair this session uh, during our masters we have done all the service that students are presenting and uh, roamed around doing studies group studies and uh, work together and we continued to pursue phd also under the same guide dr ms reddy from the department of zoology bangalore university so fond memories when students are presenting of uh, our own uh, uh, studies and uh, the associations that we had thank you uh, bp to be here with us uh, with thank that you. yeah welcome uh, with that we are now slipping into the last session of the day i am sorry that we have extended but again it's wonderful to hear from students i hope your network and net pack are giving support the fourth session will be chaired by dr tejaswini from nmkrv and dr mahendra from uh, rajasthan uh, that's uh, more from abroad uh, uh, both of you are there if i can have your consent to proceed yes sir i am here uh, thank you dr tejaswini yes dr. sir i am also here yeah thank you i made you wait both of you like other chair chairpersons as well the presenters now will start with prabhav prabhav is ready a chair person yes, kindly excuse me there has been a shuffling some students have technical glitches so there is up and down and also okay. to the two sessions shuffled yeah prabhav uh, will speak on ah. the varana species go ahead Yes, sir. Uh, one minute, I share my post. Keep it very, very crisp. Uh, uh, I know we have crossed our dinner time. Uh, we are encroaching our bedtime. Yeah. Any issue, Prabhu? Shall we move on to the other? You can join later. Yes, I'm having pro problem in shares uh, screening. Okay, take some. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe we can move on to next number. I figure okay. it out. I am. Yeah. Sumit is here. Sumit. Yeah. Yeah. Sumit, can you share and yes. go ahead? So is it visible? It's getting yes. shared. Go ahead. Yes, it's visible. Yes, sir. so. Hello, everyone. I am Samet. I am currently doing my bachelor's in zoology and botany at St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. And today to contribute to this herpetology webinar, I'll be throwing some light on the topic bioluminescence in reptiles and amphibians. Bioluminous, bioluminescence is the process of producing or emitting light naturally through chemical reactions in body. On the other hand, biofluorescence is the process of absorbing light and then re-emitting it. Both the processes are a form of chemiluminescence. This happens usually through fluorescent proteins present in skin cells or bones, while some has modified chromatophores or photophores or even light reflecting cells. These techniques help them in camouflage, attracting mates, or members of same species for defense and or, and for communication, etc. It also helps us to uh, run in the opposite direction if we ever see them in glowing in dark. Up until recent years, it was believed bioluminescence was a property exclusive to marine creatures like jellyfish, anglerfish, coral, and a, and a few terrestrial exceptions like arthropod and firefly. But in two, uh, 2015, 
the discovery of first biofluorescent reptile, the hawksbill turtle in Africa, a whole new side of bioluminescence was illuminated. Ever, ever since the discovery of ever since the discovery of the first glowing reptile, soon enough the first glowing amphibian, the polka dot dot tree frog, was also discovered in Argentina. After studies conducted by Jennifer Lamb and Matthew Davis in Minnesota, USA, it was found that many amphibians like frogs, salamanders, newts, etc. are in fact when exposed to different kinds of lights and made different use of light. For example, the Pac-Man frog and the polka dot, uh, the Pac-Man frog whose green patches glow bright green when exposed to blue light and the polka dot tree frog that turns blue from yellow and the eastern tiger salamander that glows green from yellow. Taking, uh, talking about uh, glowing reptiles, though not much have been discovered, they do exist. In a research conducted by scientists from Germany, it was found that out of 160, 30, 31 species of Kaluma chameleon showed bioluminescence. For example, Hawksbill turtle, the first ever reptile to be discovered um, showing bioluminescence, and uh, the translucent skin web-footed gecko. To conclude, not a lot of research has been done on bioluminescence in amphibians and reptiles, but with the fascinating discovery of such beautiful creatures, our new universe of life expands. Geneticists have already been using bioluminescent tech to study working of genes and for wandering into dark, looking for and for making aesthetic pleasing hybrids. And with new di discoveries, everyone's minds are wandering into the dark looking for more such illuminating creatures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sumit. It was a short and crisp uh, presentation. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Um, can you just tell me about, uh, have you gone through the biochemistry behind uh, the biofluorescence? Well, how exactly what happens during biofluorescence? Yes, it's basically, uh, they have um, bones that, that are biofluorescent, like they have those cells that, uh, there were some complicated chemical names that I couldn't exactly memorize, but there was a, complicated chemistry behind them. Uh, okay. Okay, if you have gone through, that is a whole idea of um, uh, doing this such posters. Yeah, and there's also, there's just also read-o yeah. fours that are present in the bones and the skin cells. They, they have such translucent skin that the bones uh, emit light out of the skin. And That's right. That's right. Okay. Anyways, it was a very good, um, short and crisp presentation. Congrats and all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Shumit, very nice presentations. This is the, I think, first report in the reptiles that uh, show the bioluminescence. Yes? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Keep going on this such works. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, the second presenter is Aisiri. Uh, over to you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to make a small notice to the chair that uh, we would be doing a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I hope you excuse us. Um, should I? Sh uh, I'll share. I'll be sharing my screen. Yes, you can share. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we are Aisri Hemant and Rima Davidson doing our uh, undergraduation at St. Joseph College. Uh, now we are going to present our abstract on Nasica batrachis, uh, commonly known as the pers uh, purple frog, which seems to be an evolutionary wonder. Uh, so, as you all know, that the Western Ghats, being one of the eight biological hotspots of the world. Oh, I see. In one minute. Did you share the slide? It's not visible. So sorry, sir. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so as you all know that the Western Ghats, being one of the eight biological hotspots of the world, homes many interesting diverse species, including our very own purple frog. The Nasica batrachis genus has, has only two species, that is N. sahadrensis and N. bhupati, which is named in honor of a renowned herpetologist, Dr. Subramanian Bhupati. This frog is known for its pig-like pointed nose and purple skin. Interestingly, the purple frog lives underground almost permanently, unlike other fellow amphibians, which spend a phase of their lifetime in subterranean environments. Small eyes, long snout, short limbs equipped with hardened spades and a long fluted tongue used to slurp up ants and termites enables their underground stay. They were, the adult frog was formally described in 2003, but the taxon was recognized much earlier by its tadpole in 1918. Over to you, Rima. Adding on, these frogs come above the soil only during the monsoon season to mate. Also, unlike other tadpoles, which spend their day swimming, the purple frog tadpoles develop sucker-like mouth to cling onto the rocks behind the waterfalls created by rain and feed on algae. Speaking about evolution, it's very interesting how both the species have been evolving independently from other frog species for a very long time. And surprisingly, their close relatives are in Seychelles, which is closer to Africa than India. It is thought that the two families shared a common ancestor that was subsequently isolated on different landmasses following the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. Local people consume the tadpoles. Some use the frogs for medicinal purposes and also use it to make an amulet out of it to be worn by children to reduce their fear of storms. Unfortunately, the purple frog is listed as endangered by the IUCN red list and is threatened by deforestation from expanding cultivation in addition to consumption, harvesting and also due to their specialized breeding biology disrupted by the construction of check dams. We end our presentation over here. Thank you all. Over to you, ICD. Thank you, Rima. Um, I hereby would like to thank uh, Natural Science Association and its team at uh, St. Joseph's College for providing this wonderful opportunity. I would also like to thank Dr. Jai Shankar, sir, for constantly motivating and supporting us. Uh, once again, thank you all. Very well presented. Um, may I know, are you aware of um, the conservatory programs related to uh, Purple Frog? No, ma'am. Okay. Dr. Mahindra, you want yes. to anything? Yes, I have one question. Your presentation is very nice because some very little people work on amphibians actually in India. So I have one question. Can you tell us that uh, why we take why you take this purple frog for your study? Any idea that you, you take this frog for your study? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so uh, this frog has independently evolved as compared to other frogs. And uh, it's interesting to know that uh, uh, this evolution has taken place uh, uh, during the splitting of the Gondwana uh, supercontinent. And also um, it's endemic uh, only to the Western Ghats. And, okay, uh, which you yeah. mean that uh, this frog is found only in the Asian continent or in African continent? It is okay. Uh, it is right. No, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this purple frog, Nasica batrachis, it's found only in uh, Western Ghats of India. Yes, that is the endemic species. Yes. Not found in Africa. Uh, no, but. It, uh, but uh, there's a similar uh, uh, species which is found in Seychelles. So, uh, okay, similar species or similar genus, something? 
No, no, uh, like uh, similar frogs, but uh, this genus Nasica batrachus has only two species. Yeah, so it's found that um, uh, they both uh, share the common ancestor. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Nice Thanks. presentation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Prabhav is ready. We'll go for the third. Yes. You can unshare girls uh, so that you can permit the other person to share. Yeah. Prabhav, proceed. Uh, so is my uh, screen visible? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes. But, uh, Your the PowerPoint? Mobile screen yeah. visible, I think. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. 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 This one. I think you should not be present. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Hello. Hello, all. You, think, you should uh, be zooming. Yeah. So is it no, all right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, all. Uh, my name is Prabhav Binara. Uh, and I'm doing environmental science uh, in my first year. And it's my, I have written about, I have researched about mortal lizard. Uh, and like what, uh, what's mortal lizard? Uh, I, I can found in India and uh, about them and human conflict between mortal lizard. Uh, so here I go. So, scientific name of uh, this is Varanus and phylum is Cordita. Mortal lizards are large lizards in the genus Varanus. They are native, native to Asia, Africa, Oceania, and one species is also found in America as an invasive species. There are four species of mortal lizards found <clears throat> in India. Uh, first is Bengal monitor or common India monitor. Uh, that is a mortal lizard found widely. Uh, widely in uh, all over Indian subcontinent as well as uh, part of South, uh, Southeast Asia and West Asia. Uh, and its habitat is, they are found in dry, semi-arid uh, desert habitat to flood plains, scrubland and moist forests. Uh, they are also often found in agriculture area. Uh, second is desert monitor. It's a monitor of the order Squamata found living throughout North Africa and Central or South Asia. The desert monitor is also uh, carnivorous, feeding on wide range of Vertebrae in vertebrae, and their habitat is to many environments. They can also be found in jungles and rainforests, but also in aquatic, hot, and dry areas. Uh, and third uh, is yellow monitor or golden monitor. It's a monitor lizard uh, that is uh, native to South Asia uh, and also called Goro, Gohoro, and also called Swarna Gothica in Bengali. And its habitat is a wet area and is found near the edge of the forest and near to human beings that increase the threat from direct killing and also found in agriculture areas. Next, I call it water monitor. It's a varnet lizard native to South and Southeast Asia. It is one of the most common monitor lizards found in Asia, ranging from coastal North and East India, Sri Lanka, mainland, uh, and listed as least concern in IUCN red list. So habitat is, you can find them in wetland swamp, along riverbanks, canal, and also they live uh, very near to humans and prefer habitat with flat areas for, for them to dig burrows. So if I talk about human and wellness conflict, uh, I will start with like uh, the people in India, they have a myth about like uh, wellness, like mortal lizard is poisonous. Uh, and the fact is it's not poisonous, uh, it's not poisonous and it's also very shy. And also, uh, like attack on humans only if, uh, uh, like they, they don't have. If we if we cross paths with uh, wellness, they will not attack like uh, directly to us. Uh, it's uh, like uh, people believe like they are poisonous and they also kill them. Uh, and also there are more reasons to it. Like it's haunted. It's haunted for their skin, and many things like it. Also famous for it meat and believe that it can give human strength and long liveness. And also, there's an illegal trade of their pear genitalia declared as medical plant roots called Hatta Jodi, which means uh, paired arms in um, in many parts of India. This animal is also consumed and thus making them hard to live as they very, uh, live very closely to human beings. 
like they live in uh, agriculture area or marshy land or canal so it all make the percentage of higher uh, higher or conflict of uh, between these two species very uh, and it's a very shy species but people have admit about it because of its poisonous uh, and it's proven like if you if you get even bitten of uh, bitten with a mortal lizard like it can only cause some pain or a little is illness yeah uh that's it sir okay um yes prabhav it was a nice presentation i just uh, have a suggestion that uh, you spoke about four species of uh, monitor lizard you could have uh, included the uh, photographs of these species also so that would have made your uh, poster much more interesting um however um, can you just tell me about uh, the role of uh, monitor lizard in the ecosystem can you just um, add to it uh ma'am actually i didn't have a quite uh, right idea about it mostly i have also like uh, research about it like uh, i have also researched mostly about the human and uh, monitor conflict which showed like uh, they live very close to humans uh, and that's why they have been on a threat for their life uh, this only i have uh, researched about mostly the conflict between them uh, mostly i have also uh, heard about the uh, like mo water monitor and i have uh, seen like they live in, in canals made by us only so that's uh, i've just researched about them about the conflict between them uh, that's all ma'am maybe i'm not uh, read about this okay okay never mind uh, overall it was a good presentation congrats all the best uh, thank you ma'am yeah yeah prabhav yes sir. you tell us the four different species that is very nice i want to identify all the four four species of the monitor lizard how i can differentiate can you tell us some characters basically or any guide or what do you think that how we differentiated four species because i think they are looking to same in the morphologically or maybe you can you tell us how uh, we maybe identify? we can uh, like uh, i have seen photos of desert monitor uh, so uh, desert monitor have yellow uh marks on its body uh and like it's or it's a difficult uh, sorry it's a different uh, very different color uh, as as if you uh compare with bengal monitor and i've seen like i've uh, read about uh, bengal monitor i, I think like uh, their nostrils are very visible uh, like I've, if i show you my poster uh i've i've clicked the poster uh, the back photo is mine only i've clicked that photo uh, only this, i think that is the bengal monitor lizard yeah that's the bengal monitor so yes. i've seen like i've heard about that uh, that the nostrils you can uh, yes. you can identify by that uh, like it's a, it's a bengal monitor i have clicked this in uh, jaipur only uh, this photo is okay. by me so i have i have also got no idea about uh, before that i have searched on it like it's a bengal monitor so that's how i uh, differentiated it between a, a bengal monitor and this uh, desert monitor okay then you should be try to identify all the four different species that there is some characters on the morphologically that we differentiate okay all over the nice presentation thank you thank you sir prabhu i was talking about uh, prasa mahendra mahendra is also from jaipur uh, so in future you people can work together <laughs> yeah uh, after that we have nandita nandita and kaushik the last presentation kindly keep it very very crisp uh, sorry for that demand thank you <laughs> yes sir uh, thank you uh, good evening good evening everyone just a second
Kaushik, okay, no. be ready. The next presenter. Yeah, Nandita, we are not able to. Yeah, it's getting shared. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nandita, and my poster deals with the behavioral ecology of frog acoustics and vocalization. So, um, when we talk about acoustics, or more specifically, bioacoustics, we talk about sound being generated, being dispersed, and uh, you know, being rece uh, received by animals. So the study of that is called bioacoustics. And vocalization is a method of, you know, emitting sound or emitting, uh, yeah, emitting sound by uh, the voice. Frogs are excellent models for studying animal vocalizations because their vocal repertoires or basically inventory of calls are quite impressive and species specific. We can actually distinguish between different species on the basis of their call alone. For example, the Kolimalai bush frog, the Rauschestis Kolimalai, was discovered by Gowande Ganesh and Zishan Mirza in 2020 on the basis of its distinct call. I mean, not on the basis. That was the thing that, uh, I mean, they were collecting the calls of different uh, frogs and they realized that this frog's uh, call was different from the others. And that made them, you know, analyze all the parameters uh, which led them to describe a new species. So the factors that determine the uniqueness of a call are amplitude, frequency, pitch, saturation, call duration, loudness, call rate, signal to noise ratio, etc. We all know what amplitude, frequency, uh, loud, uh, pitch and loudness are. Saturation deals with how much humidity is uh, there in the uh, larynx of the frogs, which leads to a change in their call. Duration, yes, we know what it is, uh, how long the call uh, of the frog is. The call rate is the number of uh, calls that the frog, uh, you know, makes in one minute. And signal to noise ratio deals with comparing the signals that we get from the frog in com like with the environmental noise or the background noise. So how do, uh, how do males uh, uh, create vocalizations? Basically, what they do is they vocalize by squeezing their lungs with their nostrils and mouth shut. Air is then forced over the vocal cords and into a closed system of chambers that includes the mouth cavity. So a thin wall sac at the base of the mouth then blows up like a balloon, radiating the call from the vocal cords into the environment. So this is what males do. Females lack uh, vocal sacs. So uh, what is interesting about their calls is the behavioral mechanisms that are involved in you know, these vocalizations. Uh, so one is the advertisement call. Males start their uh, sexual, uh, yeah, males start their sexual behavior by calling you know, millisecond long calls in intervals of one millisecond or you know, even a few minutes. And uh, they do it to uh, advertise themselves or basically attract females. And uh, let's say that uh, there's the presence of another frog or a rival frog. Then for that, they have these specific signals as well. Encounter rivalry, aggressive songs and calls. And um, there's, a, there's an interesting phenomenon called eavesdropping. A females also do it. Males also do it. So... When a lot of frogs make uh, vocalizations, some frogs take advantage of it and make manipulations to their behavior. So uh, they intercept those calls and sometimes they parasitize or they use the calls of other males and use them to uh, you know, attract the female. And then uh, some males get intimidated by the competition and withdraw from the uh, you know, advertisement, and some males uh, react even more aggressively towards other males' calls. Release calls, I mean, uh, you know, as the word itself mentions, uh, they like, uh, these frogs release, you know, I mean, they create vocalizations called release calls when they want to be released in the presence of a predator or, um, uh, you know, an alien organism. Courtship calls, yes, uh, even females sometimes, you know, rarely uh, vocalize courtship calls. 
and distress is yes again in the presence of uh, you know predators and uh, sometimes when a lot of frogs emanate sounds there are certain adaptations to avoid vo vocal overlaps the thing is yeah when a lot of when there is a chorus of sounds uh, some calls can get interfered or some calls can get masked by other things so in order to prevent that they include these adaptations spectral sharing basically uh, some frogs uh, emit sounds of different frequencies you know different frequencies meaning different pitch time sharing uh, frogs call at different times of the day periodic stereotyped call uh, some males manipulate their vocalization in such a way that uh, they they make it so monotonous or they make it so they make it constant so that uh, their voice is very easily recognizable and another is loudness shrillness persistence yeah these are all adaptations to avoid vocal overlaps uh one more interesting thing to talk about is you know females are rarely the ones who vocalize they, in fact they never do uh, at least they don't have you know advertisement calls or calling songs except for one species the smooth guardian frog or the limnonectis palavinensis so the females here croak they actually they actually have advertisement calls and this is argued to be a possible case of sex role reversal because it's usually the males that uh, uh, emit these calls right but here in this case females emit these calls quite possibly to attract the males and yeah that's about it uh, thank you okay uh, thank you nandita um i know yours is a behavioral ecology but uh, have you gone through the relationship between the hormone level and vocalization if you have gone through can you just add to it i am sorry i haven't ma'am actually this is just uh, regarding the behavioral ecology i have uh, gone through the anatomical aspects but not the hormones i will look into it thank you okay Nandita. Yes, sir. This is your primary data, yeah, or means this is your own study. This is uh, this is all data that I've derived from uh, different papers, uh, different references. Yes, sir. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the last presenter for the session is Kaushik. Kaushik, you are here. Yes, sir. I'm present, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to request you. Please make it crisp, being the last presenter. After that, the final vote of thanks. Basil, be ready, please. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, can I share my screen now? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yes. OK, sir. Are you guys able to see my screen, sir? We are, we are able to see you. We are seeing you. Okay, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry no. for the mistake. No, we got to see you. Uh, okay. Hmm. Window. Yes. Are you able to see the screen now, sir? Is the screen visible, sir? No, not it. Is it visible now, sir? Don't use no. the whiteboard. Whiteboard. Uh, that's not the option. You have to go to the screen. Share the screen, entire screen, and open your PPT. 
Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, I got right. it, sir. Proceed, please. So, good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening to all the respected dignitaries and all the students at St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. I would like to thank Dr. Jayashankar, sir, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak uh, on the topic impact of climate change on frogs, which actually is an interesting topic to speak upon. Because as you know, we we do not consider amphibians and reptiles as a major species or as a major organism to what is happening around the world. We almost always look down upon them. Like we, be, uh, we are scared of amphibians. We are scared of amphibians and reptiles. So uh, from the, I just wanted to start the topic. But in, uh, before starting the topic, I just wanted to uh, let you guys know about the role that amphibians, especially frogs, play in the environment. We know that we invest so much time in uh, the conservation of species like tigers, elephants, lions, and all other major species which we see around us. But why do we invest so much time in frogs rather than the other species which I had told before. Because in nature's drama, even the seemingly insignificant frogs have an important role to play. Amphibians, although small, have a great impact in sustaining the biodiversity and ensuring the food forest cover remains. In monsoon, in monsoon season and even during the summers, if frogs and toads are gone, it will lead to a rise in insect population, their main prey. And also it will lead to a decline in their predators. As we all know, amphibians play a role of bo uh, play both the roles in nature, according to the food web. They are both the predator as well as the prey. So this disappearance will in fact affect all of us. And that's why uh, uh, a change from the uh, a change in this world where there are no amphibians, especially frogs, will unfortunately lead to our own demise. So the main issue uh, why uh, frogs or amphibians are not up, uh, are being extinct is because of climate change. As we can see from the presentation, the impact of climate change is so major that they can lead to decreased depth of pond water where they are most commonly seen. And this climate change is due to an increased intensity of UV radiation, which ultimately reduces the immune system of amphibians, hence making them more prone to diseases like the Rana virus. Rana virus uh, is a disease which most commonly affect reptiles, amphibians, and different kinds of fish, different species of fish. So this UV radiation not only causes diseases in these amphibians, but also damages their DNA and kill cells, causing a huge number of egg mortality, lesions found in the skin, and also an increased susceptibility to disease along with low pH and this lo low pH in fact leads to the ultimate demise of the frog. As we all know there are about 277 species of frogs present in, in of amphibians present in India and out of these 277 species of amphibians 180 of them are frogs and toads out of which majority of these frogs and toads come under the red list of the IUCN where they are either in the category in the vulnerable category or major or endangered due to human activities it's not just how they affect the world sir it's also how the global warming has increased a decline in their population that we see 
we nowadays see that frogs and amphibians as the most insignificant animal species of all time. Thank you, sir. And also, I would like to thank my team members Devika and Stella for the constant support during the uh, during this whole uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, Kaushik, uh, it was uh, the poster is uh, very nicely designed with all the information. And Thank you, um, um, this the data which you have collected is from other research papers. Is it? Yes, ma'am. They are from other research papers and from well known websites too. OK, and uh, you have included the uh, pollution level also into the uh, impact or it's just the climate change what you have included. Basically, climate change, uh, uh, it's basically on how climate change affects the lives of frogs, ma'am. Yeah, but you, you did speak about um, greenhouse and uh, global warming. So I just wanted to just ask, uh, did you study about even the pollution and uh, related to that? Uh, also, did you go through the research papers? Yes, ma'am, I had. Uh... I had read a paper about how pollution affects the life of these amphibians. I just wanted to uh, give a main uh, give a highlight on the on my topic, which is impact of climate change on frogs. So I had I had written a point about how pollution affect these animals. Okay. But instead of highlighting pollution, I just wanted to show you guys how uh, climate effect affects them majorly than compared to pollution. OK, OK. Um, yeah, very well uh, done. Uh, congrats and all the best. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Jay Shankar, sir, Koshik. for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Koshik. Yes, sir. You take the Rana Tiger in us. Yes. Yes, sir. I think this name is now considered Hoplobatrecus tigerinus. Did you know? Yes, sir. Now, I think most of university not teach us the Rana, any genus. So you should be considered Hoplobatrecus tigerinus. OK. OK, sir, we'll surely second consider it the next time I'm doing a presentation on this topic, sir. And second information that I given to you, that is the you given the number of the species that is recorded from the India. That is, I think, 300 something, no? But uh, yes, sir, actually, uh, uh, the number of species which I had given in the presentation is before the uh, are you is bef is when before the IUCN list came into being. That was when the uh, number of species of frogs, amphibians particularly, were 380. Now it has reduced to 277. No. And about in 180 in of them are frogs and toads. In India, there is 2019 data that is from the JSI, that is around 427 species reported. OK, so, so we said that India in India, JSI is updated all the faunal species that is found in India. So yes, you sir. should be check uh, time to time JSI website and see the update. That is the what is the new species or what is the species? in any class or phylums or any group. OK. So sure, sir. and uh, as of now, in the Western Guts, there has been another population of frogs which has been introduced, which were considered to be critically endangered, uh, officially extinct. Actually, that is the Minervaria Vental, which has been recently discovered in the Western Guts region of India. 
Okay. But you should be check the website of the JSI. I think that is authentic websites and authentic data that is provided by the government authority. Okay. So yes, thank sir, you, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gosik. You do in future good work. I hope. Thank you. I thank both the chairpersons uh, considering the time. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have. Uh, I'm limiting the concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Tejaswini and. Um,